Hello everyone. In the following video presentation, I will be going through the analysis of the poem Vultures by Chinua Achebe. Chinua Achebe was born in Nigeria. Although he was raised as a Christian, he was also exposed to traditional evil culture. He excelled in school, became an English teacher, worked for the Nigerian Broadcasting Service, and involved himself in a mix of academia and Nigerian politics. He published many poems, short stories, children's books, and essay collections, and he also won a series of literary awards. Let's briefly look at some background information to the poem. At a first glance, the title Vultures may suggest that this poem is about these actual scavenging birds of prey. However, we will soon understand that this poem is not just a literal description of vultures. Rather, these scavengers that feed on dead flesh are used by Chinua Achebe to explore and represent the nature of evil and the cruelty of mankind. This is an important point that I would like you to keep in mind as we analyse the poem. The inspiration that Achebe had for writing this poem was his witnessing of the horrors in the Nigerian Civil War that took place between July 1967 to January 1970. Let's read through the poem. At this stage, try and see if anything you read makes sense to you or resonates with you. In the greyness and drizzle of one despondent dawn, unstirred by harbingers of sunbreak, a vulture perching high on broken bone of a dead tree, nestled close to his mate, his smooth bashed in head, a pebble on a stem, rooted in a dump of gross feathers, inclined affectionately to hers. Yesterday they picked the eyes of a swollen corpse in a waterlogged trench and ate the things in its bowel. Full gorge they chose their roost, keeping the hallowed remnant in easy range of cold telescopic eyes. Strange indeed how love, in other ways so particular, will pick a corner in that charnel house, tidy it and coil up there, perhaps even fall asleep, her face turned to the wall. Thus the commandant at Balsan camp going home for the day, with fumes of human roast clinging rebelliously to his hairy nostrils, will stop at the wayside sweet shop and pick up a chocolate for his tender offspring waiting at home for daddy's return. Praise bounteous providence, if you will, that grants even an ogre a tiny glowworm tenderness encapsulated in icy caverns of a cruel heart, or else despair, for in the very germ of that kindred love is lodged the perpetuity of evil. For the next few minutes of this presentation, let's analyse this poem. There is quite a lot of information to absorb, but let's take it one line at a time. In the greyness and drizzle of one despondent dawn, unstirred by harbingers of sunbreak, the word drizzle refers to steady light rain. The word despondent means miserable or disheartened. Unstirred means undisturbed. A harbinger refers to someone or something that announces the arrival of another. We could say that one harbinger of dawn is the birds, as if you have ever been woken up by the sound of birds singing, you can usually deduce that the morning has arrived. Here in this grey, miserable and colourless setting, there is not a sound. Looking back at the word harbingers, this word is ominous as harbingers are normally associated with death and doom. These first few lines paint quite a vivid picture of this dawn. The opening of the poem is dark and gloomy. The dawn is grey and despondent. There is no indication that the sun may shine. The sun, a provider of light and life, is made to seem negative. 
Notice also the alliteration in the words drizzle, despondent and dawn. We can interpret this as the grimness being emphasized with the repetition of the D sound. The next few lines read, A vulture perching high on broken bones of a dead tree, nestled close to his mate. Here we have personification. The tree is given the human quality of having bones, suggesting that this tree on which the vulture is perched has no leaves or life. The first few lines in this poem already established a gloomy and ominous feeling, and this line adds to this feeling, with an image associated with death. This vulture, perched on this dead tree, is described as nestled close to his mate. Nestled means huddling close to someone or something. The word nestled suggests quite an intimate image. We don't usually associate vultures, which are revolting scavengers, with images of tenderness and intimacy. As it reads in this block, this image of tenderness is unsuitable to the usual image of a vulture as a revolting scavenger. His smooth bashed in head, a pebble on a stem rooted in a dump of gross feathers, inclined affectionately to hers. Let's consider the word gross. The word can mean unpleasant or disgusting. The vulture's head is described as a pebble on a stem rooted in a dump of gross feathers. The figure of speech we have in these lines is a metaphor. The two images being compared are the vulture's head on its neck to a small stone or pebble on the end of a stem or twig. This suggests the vulture's head is balancing on the end of its thin neck. The vulture's neck is also set in a mass of filthy feathers. These words paint quite a disgusting and unpleasant image of the vulture. The vulture's head is inclined affectionately to hers. In other words, his head is nestling up to his mate's head. As it says in this block, this repulsive image contrasts with the vulture's affectionate feelings towards his mate. We can interpret this image as a symbol of the idea that in every creature there is the potential for both affection and unpleasantness or evil. The next few lines of the poem are quite gruesome. The poem reads, Yesterday they picked the eyes of a swollen corpse in a waterlogged trench and ate the things in its bowel. Before we analyse these lines, remember the word corpse refers to a dead body. A waterlogged trench refers to a ditch filled perhaps with stagnant water. And the word bowels refers to the corpse's intestines. In these lines, the eating habits of the vultures are described. The grotesque image of the vultures feeding off a rotting corpse is a disturbing reminder that vultures are scavengers. The vultures pick the corpse clean, including the things in its bowels. The diction or choice of words in these lines used to describe the eating habits of the vultures are disturbing and grotesque. Full gorge they chose their roost. To gorge means to overeat. This is also quite a disgusting image. The vultures haven't just eaten to satisfy their hunger, but they have greedily consumed much more than they need. After eating, the vultures are described as choosing their roost. Roost refers to a place such as a branch where birds rest. While perched on the branch of this dead tree, they are keeping the hollowed remnant in easy range. The corpse is referred to as the hollowed remnant. The word hollowed means dug out or emptied. What is left of this corpse is a remnant. A remnant is a piece of something remaining or left over. What we can picture is a corpse with not much flesh left on it. A hollowed remnant of what the body used to be. 
This body is still within the vulture's sights, in easy range of cold telescopic eyes. Telescopic refers to being able to see far. Telescopic eyes that are cold could remind us of something mechanical. Here we have a metaphor where perhaps the vultures are compared to something like a sniper's gun with a telescopic lens because these vultures keep an eye on the remnant with their telescopic eyes. Using the word cold could suggest a heartlessness about these vultures. Strange indeed how love in other ways so particular will pick a corner in that charnel house, tidy it and coil up there, perhaps even fall asleep, her face turned to the wall. The word particular in this context could refer to being hard to please or fussy. A charnel house is a storage place for corpses or bodies, like a morgue. The word coil means to curl up. As you can see, the subject matter of the poem has shifted from the literal description of vultures to an aside in which the speaker contemplates the nature of love. In these lines, love has been personified as a woman. The interpretation here is despite being hard to please or being particular, this woman, which is love, is able to find a way of existing in the most unpleasant environments, the charnel house, by clearing a corner and turning to face the wall. An interpretation that love, or the woman, turns her face to the wall, ignoring the charnel house behind her, could mean that where evil exists, love would try to ignore the presence of evil. In these next lines, the subject matter changes once again. The next lines deal with the commandant or army officer at Belson Camp. The poem reads, Thus the commandant at Belson Camp, going home for the day with fumes of human roast clinging rebelliously to his hairy nostrils. Belson Camp was one of the Nazi concentration camps where the brutal torture and extermination of thousands of Jews took place. These exterminations would have been overseen by the commandant. The commandant is described as going home for the day, with fumes of human roast clinging to his nostrils. This is quite a shocking image because of the connotations the word roast has of cooking. The next line is also disturbing because the smell of burning flesh that clings to the commandant's nostrils after he leaves the camp is a haunting reminder of how the Jews were incinerated in the concentration camp. The commandant here will stop at the wayside sweet shop. Wayside refers to the edge of a road. In other words, after his day at work, the commandant will go past a sweet shop that is situated at the edge of the road. The commandant will pick up a chocolate for his tender offspring or his children who are waiting at home for daddy's return. Here we have another image of tenderness that seems out of place and that even makes us feel uncomfortable. It is difficult to place the idea of the commandant's gruesome job alongside the idea of a loving family man who stops on his way home to buy sweets for his children who affectionately call him daddy. Where else in the poem so far have we had these contrasting ideas of tenderness and evil? Right in the beginning of the poem where the nestling vultures are described. Here is a question I would like you to consider for a moment. Do you think there is a huge difference between the behavior of the vultures and that of the Nazis? Do you agree that the vultures are performing a vital ecological service and are acting on instinct while the humans have the ability to make moral decisions and this is where the real evil lies? 
Think about this for a second. Vultures overindulging on a corpse in a gruesome manner is not because it is what they consciously choose to do. They are merely acting on instinct. However, humans, like the camp commandant, have a choice about whether or not to commit acts of good or acts of evil. The fact that some humans, like the camp commandant, still choose to commit horrendous acts, even though they don't have to, is where true evil lies. The next few lines provide us with a conclusion to the ideas in this poem. It reads, Praise bounteous providence, if you will, that grants even an ogre a tiny glowworm tenderness encapsulated in icy caverns of a cruel heart. Let's first go through these lines one at a time to discuss the meanings of some of the words. Bounteous means plentiful or in abundance. Providence refers to God. In other words, these two lines are saying, praise God in abundance if you will or if you choose to. So a God that grants or gives even an ogre or an extremely cruel person a tiny glowworm. A glowworm is a beetle that produces a small amount of light from its body. What I want you to keep in mind here is that we can associate light with love. So here we can say that this tiny bit of light is equated to a small amount of love. Love here is the word tenderness. Tenderness encapsulated or closed in or enveloped in icy caverns or cold crevices of a cruel heart. You will soon notice that we are offered two choices from the speaker's description in these last few lines of the poem. These lines here offer us our first option, which is to be thankful to God for the fact that there is a tiny glowworm of goodness hidden in the icy caverns of a cruel heart. In other words, we can feel a sense of hope because love can exist in even the most evil of creatures. Think back to the camp commandant for a moment. In this first option, the speaker is saying that we can thank God that at least this hateful ogre or monster of a man who is responsible for the extermination of people during the day has a tiny bit of love within him as he is able to show his children warmth and affection. These last few lines provide us with our second option. They read, or else despair, for in the very germ of that kindred love is lodged the perpetuity of evil. Again, let us discuss the meaning of some of the words. Despair means a loss of hope. Germ, in this context, refers to the root source or core of that kindred love Kindred means familial or the same. Is lodged the perpetuity, which means forever lasting or eternity of evil. In other words, these lines are saying to us that we can feel a sense of hopelessness because at the very core of a love that is familiar, evil will always exist. So our second option here is that instead of having a sense of gratitude that some love exists within an evil person, our option here is that we could have a sense of hopelessness and despair because at the root of a person's capacity or capability for love and goodness, there will always be the existence of evil. With which option would you be inclined to agree? Let us briefly take a look at the form and technique of this poem. Vultures is written in free verse, which means that this poem has no particular rhythm, no particular rhyme scheme, and the lines have different lengths. There is also minimal punctuation at the end of the lines of the poem. This is called enjambment or run on lines. 
What enjambment does, it creates flow when the poem is read. If you had to look at the poem as a whole, you would notice that the poem is divided into four sections. Each section is marked by an indented line or with an ellipsis to indicate changes in thought. Section 1 is a description of the actual vultures. Notice the end of the thought is indicated with an ellipsis. Section 2 is a description of the nature of love. The beginning of this thought is indicated by an indent of the word strange. Section 3 is a description of the Balsam Camp Commandant and the beginning of this thought is indicated by an ellipsis. The end of this thought is also indicated by an ellipsis. Section 4 is the conclusion to the poem in which we are provided with two options. The beginning of this thought is indicated by an indent of the word praise. In terms of technique, Chinua Achebe expresses his theme powerfully due to his diction or his choice of words, the disturbing imagery he has created, and his use of contrast.